Thank you for joining us here on Theology Refresh. I'm David Mathis. This is Desiring God's podcast for pastors and for Christian leaders. Typically, we take a doctrine and seek to refresh you on it, but we have a unique episode here. We have Dr. Joel Beakey with us, co-author with Mark Jones of A Puritan Theology, Doctrine for Life, and we're going to talk about the Puritans. Uh, Dr. Beakey, let's, let's put it on the bottom shelf and put ourselves in the shoes of someone who would ask, okay, who even are the Puritans? From start at, at stage one, who are the Puritans? Well, technically the Puritans are a group of people, particularly led by very God-fearing ministers in the second half of the 16th century and the entire 17th century. And including Jonathan Edwards, I would argue, in the 18th century, as sort of as a Puritan born out of, out of due time, who really, with heart, mind, and soul, wanted to vigorously pursue purity in worship, uh, purity in walk of life, and purity in every sphere of their daily living. Mm -hmm. So they wanted, for example, doctrinally, they were, they were robust Calvinists, um, Experientially, they were warm and contagious and really lived for the glory of God. Evangelistically, they were tender yet aggressive. And ecclesiastically, they, they loved the bride, uh, Jesus' church, but they were very concerned about the church being watered down and not maintaining the full orb of Scripture. Hmm. It's a group of pastors and theologians. You mentioned Edward, so not just... England, also in the United States, some. Is that yes, yes. It wasn't, there were 2,000 Puritans that were uh, ejected from their pulpit in 1662 f with the act of uniformity because the Queen, Queen Elizabeth wanted them to conform to the entire Book of Common Prayer and they couldn't in their conscience. But th a lot of these men also came over to New England and so that Puritans there are also included, of course. It's fair to say originally Anglicans right. that wanted to purify the Anglican church. Is that overly simplistic? Or? You, no, that's not. It, but some of the Puritans stayed in the Anglican church and conformed completely, even though they had a rough time with their conscience. Other Puritans partially conformed and got away with it. Uh, many Puritans partially conformed and were thrown in jail for not conforming completely. Um, probably half of the Puritan ministers were in jail at some point. And then others just said we got to say farewell, even though it pains us, to the Church of England and go on our own. Mm -hmm. And they were more separatistic. So here we are in 21st century as Americans uh, talking about these guys who were largely English, at least came out of the Anglican Church in the 15th, 16th century. What was it about that time that, that produced them? Or is the fact that we're English speakers and they wrote in English one of the things that's so relevant for us about the Puritans? Well, they did write in English, of course, and that was helpful. But I think what's relevant is this. In the 16th century, you know, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Bullinger come along, and they bring us all the great doctrines of grace. And they spend their whole lifetime hammering these out and explaining them, writing commentaries. The Puritans come along two generations later after the so-called second generation phenomena, mm -hmm. which means that things kind of dry up and people kind of take it for granted. And they say, wow, these are great doctrines. But who's living them? And we need to live them with all our heart, all our life, all our soul, head, heart, and hand. Hmm. So the head needs to be informed with this robust Calvinism. The heart needs to be inflamed. And then the hands need to go into action. That's good. How did you get into the Puritans? So, you know, here you are, 21st century person, more informed than most of us about this group of theologians and pastors. What brought you into the Puritans? I just had my 60th birthday, <laughs> and I started reading the Puritans when I was nine, so I guess I've got 51 <laughs> years under my belt. Um, I raided my dad's bookcase because I came under conviction of sin, and I actually grew up in a fairly hyper-Calvinistic setting, didn't hear much gospel, and the Puritans encouraged me. Hmm. And when I was 14, that conviction got worse, and I really then read them every night. Uh, my mother would call upstairs and say, turn out the lights, it's 11 o'clock, I'd turn them out. When they went to bed, I'd turn them back on. I, every night, I'd just be reading the Puritans, marking up the books, and I, I read my whole dad's, my dad's entire bookcase of Puritans. What was it that so captured you? Was it the, how emotional they were, how earnest? 
It was everything. Um, there, there's no more well-rounded group of theologians in church history than the Puritans because they addressed the head. You know, when they preached, they basically addressed the mind first. They knew that a mindless Christianity was a spineless Christianity. Then they moved to the conscience and spoke to the conscience, warning, but also wooing. And then they moved to your, your actions in life. And so they wooed the heart. They um, beat on the conscience. They informed the mind and they moved you to action. Mm -hmm. and talk about misconceptions, because I know the Puritans are a group that have many misconceptions swirling about them. Probably the first time I ever heard of the Puritans in a U.S. history class, and it was a derogatory talk, way of talking about the Puritans. What are some of those misconceptions, and how would those need to be corrected? Yes, well, one of the misconceptions, for example, is that the Puritans are prudish, they didn't have fun in life, they're killjoys. And I would argue that the Puritans were probably the happiest group of people that ever lived on the face of the earth. Hmm. Because to be truly happy is to be holy and to live to the glory of God. And that's what they did better than anyone else. Hmm. And they had wonderful family. You know, we think of family life. We think of you being very dedicated to your wife and being romantic with your wife rather than some mistress out there. Um, that whole concept of a God-glorifying home where the home is a little church and serves and worship God, that's bequeathed to us from the Puritans. The Puritans were happy men with happy marriages and, and, and happy spouses. And they wrote all kinds of textbooks on marriage and how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife. In fact, we're reprinting the most famous one right now, William Googe, Domestical Duties. So what, what you get from the Puritans is a whole way of living seamlessly to the glory of God. And that's really where they excel. And so their joy was in, as Piper would say, delighting in God. And, and of course, Piper gleaned that originally from, from Jonathan Edwards and, and, and developed it from there. And, and Edwards is just climaxing everything the, Pur the Puritans have said over, over a century and a half. This is it. God-centered living hmm. brings joy. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, to the book, A Puritan Theology, big book you and Mark Jones put together. Uh, what is it that Puritan theology, if you can simplify it in that way, and, as you guys do in the book, what is it that Puritan theology brings to kind of a typical 21st century Reformed theology? You know, just kind of broad Reformed theology. W what is uh, accentuated or added to or helped by quote-unquote Puritan theology? Yeah, well, let, let me just say in the book that, that um, I, I, I've dreamed of writing this book since I was a teenager because I realized even as a teenager that there isn't a single book ever written in hi history that was really a systematic theology of what the Puritans taught, looking at the doctrines of God and man and Christ and salvation and church and the last things, and really under one cover giving you the basics of Puritan teaching and showing you how they took all those doctrines and translated them into a transformed life. That's why the subtitle of the book is Doctrine Unto Life. So in the first 50 chapters, we walk through um, the doctrines, what they believe. We apply it also, how they applied it. But the last eight chapters particularly focus on how they put that doctrine into life. And what they did really was they continued the Reformation. And they brought the Reformation home, as one Puritan said, to men's business and bosoms. Mm -hmm. That is to say every area of life. How are you going to be a Christian businessman and live to the glory of God in your business? Reformers didn't have much time to, to really grapple with that. That's what they did. How are you to be a faithful, God-fearing child to your, to your parents? And they talked about that. But they also, they also expanded on many doctrines. They did a lot of work on assurance of faith. Uh, they did a lot of work on adoption into the family of God, far more than had been done before. And they did a huge amount of work on covenant theology, covenant of works, covenant of redemption, covenant of grace. Mm. We've mentioned Edwards. Uh, other names that the typical pastor should know who are part of the Puritan movement. Well, some people don't even realize that, say, John Bunyan was a Pilgrim's Progress. I mean, John Bunyan was a, was a, real, was a real Puritan. Matthew Henry's commentary is very well known. He's, he's, he's a Puritan you should know. Matthew Poole's commentary, you should know. But then there's a whole host of men that really wrote all kinds of treatises. I mean, William Perkins was the father of Puritanism. We're reprinting his works now in 10 volumes. John Flavel, Thomas Brooks have six volumes each. Um, there's just so many good, savory Puritans. Mm -hmm. So where would you recommend somebody start? if they are, Maybe this is the first time they're hearing about Puritans or hearing about a definition and some details. 
Where would you send them now to start on Puritan? Well, I'd start with three little books that we published at Reformation Heritage Books that takes just 100-page treatises of Puritans, very short books, and puts them in contemporary print without changing any meaning of any sentence. Uh, William Greenhill, Stop Loving the World. John Flavel, Triumphing Over Sinful Fear. And once you get a flavor of the incredible riches of their spirituality, and maybe that's the most important thing of all, how deeply they go into your soul and into your mind and transform your life and, and do, do move you more towards holiness, then you'll be ready to move on. You, you, you get caught up with these books. You won't, you won't have any trouble with any words in these books. And then move on to some of the simple Puritans in their original writing, like uh, Thomas Watson. He writes with short sentences, very pithy, um, beautiful stuff. Heaven Taken by Storm by Thomas Watson, I would recommend. And then move on to John Flavel. His sermons are very captivating. And John Bunyan. And then gradually move on your way to the more difficult ones and uh, end up with Thomas Goodwin and John Owen. Mm, that's good. Thank you so much for doing this. This has been very helpful to me. I think our listeners will appreciate this little primer on Puritanism. Would you close us in prayer for our listeners? Sure. Great God of heaven, we thank you so much for the great heritage entrusted to us in the Puritans. Lord, we know they weren't perfect, but may we follow them insofar as they follow Christ. It's so easy to berate them because they don't think exactly like we think in all areas, but help us, Lord, to be as holy as they were and be as earnest about our relationship with thee and with others as they were, to be as godly as they were, and help us to live holy and solely for Jesus Christ and for thee, the triune God. Help us to say what one Puritan said, I don't know which divine person I love the most, but this I know, I love each of them and I need them all. Make us as Trinitarian in our theology as they were, as ravished as they were with thy word and with thyself. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.